Matthew chapter 20, we'll get in to the word of the Lord. Thank you for being here this morning. I, we have many, many things going on around here. We have children's church going on, both services today. And uh, we also have uh, fireworks on the hillside. If you buy fireworks for your kids or grandkids, buy them here. If you don't buy them for your grandkids, buy me some. Buy them here. So. Anybody hot in here? I believe it's rather warm. Brother Steve, would you bring me a box of Kleenexes there? I left my handkerchief. I don't have a lot figured out in life. As a matter of fact, the longer I live, Joe, you're going to have to take the reverb out of here for me. The longer I live, the less I have figured out, but I think I've got one thing figured out. My walk with Jesus depends on my walk with you. My walk with Jesus depends on my walk with my wife, my children, the people I go to church with, the people I work with. My walk with the Lord is 100%. Well, I don't know about that 100%, Pastor. My walk with the Lord is 100% about relationships. We get everything else all mixed up. We get confused about all these different things, and we could preach about a thousand different things and, and go a thousand different directions. But the greatest commandment is to love God, and the next the commandment that's parallel to that is to love your neighbor. And the Bible says so many things about relationships. We read it last week, and uh, the dream that this lady in my brother's church had, she had a dream all night, and she you kept remembering the numbers 4, 7, and 11. And so um, she, uh, uh, Danny said, I don't usually listen to people with dreams because I've heard, and he's pastored long enough to hear some crazy stuff. And, and uh, I said it in the second service last week, but it just stuck with me. Uh, she just kept. She woke up and she the numbers she she remembered vividly her dream, everything and and uh, uh, the numbers that kept going over in her head was four, seven, and eleven. So she got up and she she googled it. I haven't tried googling it, and I bet it doesn't work except in her case. But she got up and she just googled four comma seven comma eleven, and the first thing that popped up was First Peter chapter four verse 7 through verse 11. And my dad told me about this, and I, 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 he said, I'm not going to tell you what it says. I want you to look it up for yourself. And, and I did, and I want to read it again this morning. Uh, the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins or love in any other version. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister... Let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. If I'm going to do this right, I've got to set a lot of religious ideas aside. If I'm going to do this right, I've got to, let, I, I, I've got to make sure that if the end of all things is at hand, that my relationship with you is proper because if my relationship with you is improper, the end of all things is ha being at hand is not good news for me. I'm going to have difference of opinion, and I know that some of you find that really hard to believe, but I'm going to have a difference of opinion uh, about some things than you do. And obviously you think you're right, and obviously I am right, but whatever the case may be, 
We all have our opinions, and we're not going to have the same opinion about everything. As a matter of fact, I don't think this group of people in here, we would have the, all of us would have the same opinion about anything. We're going to have differences of opinion. And too often we allow differences of opinion to divide our relationship. We don't get along because we have a different opinion. We don't get along because we don't agree. I don't think that has anything to do with getting along. I think just because we disagree doesn't mean we shouldn't get along. That's good preaching. Because if we're not careful, we will let some, and I want to use as strong a word as I can here in this pulpit this morning, we'll let some stupid little thing. Everybody say stupid with me. Most of the things that cause our relationships to be destroyed, most of the differences that divide us, most of the reasons, I know there's a lot of big reasons for divorce, but most of the reasons for that are just stupid things that you add one stupid thing on top of another stupid thing and pretty soon you got a mountain of stupid. You go to church with the same people for 100 years and you get a mountain of stupid. Boy, that's good preaching. You work with the same group of people for a long time, and you, know, you remember that first day, you were ignorant. You thought everybody there was great. You worked there about two weeks, and you realized everybody there is an idiot, but you. And we allow things to cause us to break our relationship. And when we've broken our relationship, we've broken the greatest commandment. And when you break the greatest commandment, we could talk about Pentecostals and Baptists and Presbyterians and Muslims and Episcopalians and Hinduism, and we could talk about all those things. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and his blood's going to have to wash away your sins. And when his blood has washed away your sins, the way that you're going to know that his blood has washed away your sins and that he's forgiven you of your sins and that he's filled you with his spirit, the way you're going to know that is in your relationships with other people. That's what the Bible says. And so I want to talk about the number one relationship that we should have with other people. Matthew chapter 20, real quickly. And we'll read these verses right real quick. Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 20, and we'll read down through verse number 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's son came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. She came very humbly and said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I am to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And I preached a lot about that. That's some strong language. They said to him, we are able. They had no idea what they were talking about, but they answered it anyway. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right and my left is not mine to give, but it is for those from whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, or the, the other ten disciples, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. They were angry. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whosoever desires to become great among you. Stop right there for just a second, Scotty. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And in the message it says, you must become his slave. Woo. Jesus was my slave. Jesus was my whipping boy. He, take, he took the beating that I didn't have to take. Let him be your servant, verse 27. And whosoever or whoever desires to be first, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Somebody say amen. She was, uh, she was happy. She had great aspirations. She wanted her kids to be successful. We all do. She, she thought her boys were the most handsome of all the 12 disciples. She thought they were smartest. She was sure that their ACT score was higher than anybody else's. Out of those 12 guys, these two boys outshined them all because they were her boys. 
She was excited about that. And she understood that other mothers probably wanted the same thing, but other mothers' boys wouldn't as qualified as her boys. How many of you have boys and can say amen to that? Some, some of you got boys and you can't say amen to that. But. She knew other mothers were going to probably be jockeying for position and wanting to ask the same question, so she wanted to be first. And so she came in a humble pose, and she knelt before him. And when she knelt before him, he said, What do you want, or what, what can I do for you? And, and she asked that question. And when she asked that question, the other disciples got really upset. And the, the one version said they were enraged. How dare they ask that question? But Jesus called and said, listen, they don't even understand how the question that they're asking. Yes, they're going to have to drink my cup. Yes, they're going to have to go where I'm going. They're going to have to experience some things in life. But they don't really understand what they're asking. He said, in order for them to, to, to wear my crown, in order for them to sit on my left hand and my right hand, whoever does that, he's going to have to first become a servant to everybody. And boy, when we start thinking about relationships and we start thinking about the kingdom of God and when we start thinking about how we should all get along, in order for us to all get along, we have to position ourselves properly. I I, I was speaking with a pastor this past week of a a, a medium-sized church and, and he was just talking about I wanted my opinion, and I, I was glad he wanted my opinion, but they were they were fussing. They were having, uh, uh, his church was having all sorts of fusses, and they were fussing over the kind of music. They were fussing over uh, uh, everything from the color of the, they were doing a little bit of remodeling, the color of the carpet, the color of the paint on the walls. They were fussing about uh, whether they were going to sing contemporary music or, 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 or traditional music, hymns or choruses, and they were fussing about all that. And so they would just they would have these meetings, and everybody would just everybody's opinion. And and, and my opinion was you got, and I think he he appreciated what I said. I said, yeah, how many committees? We got committees for everything. He said, we got folks deciding on this and meeting on that. And I said, what it is is there's too many people making one decision. You got. 20 heads and a body with 20 heads is not going to function properly. A body with no feet is not going to be able to get up and go anywhere. And so you're just stalling out because nobody's willing to stand up and just make a decision and say, hey, we're going to paint them green or whatever. I'm going to tell you something. It don't matter what color the walls are or the church I go to. What matters is the spirit I feel inside those green walls. And so we've got to get our position correct. And we've got to, and God's called us all. We all have visions of grandeur. We all grow up want to be something special. I, I used to ask Curtis what he wanted to be, and he said, I don't care as long as I'm rich. He just wanted to be rich. He, didn't, he, he knew he was going to be rich. He just didn't have any idea how he was going to get there. But we all have who among us has not at one time or another thought about being a, 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 a an NBA player? I know I, that was a dream when I was a kid and, and until I realized white men can't jump and I just had to give that up. But the, the, the who among us hadn't thought about being on American Idol or The Voice or uh, uh, I, I, I've thought about preaching these massive conferences, these football stadiums full of people. And I, I can sit and watch a Billy Graham crusade from 30 years ago and just be fascinated at, the, at what's going on there. I, I, I can imagine the anointing and the burden that he must have felt uh, in those days preaching to that many people. So who of us at one time or another hadn't thought about doing something special? I mean, that's kind of what's expected of us. We're Americans. I'm so thankful to be American. How about you? Ian was back in the Philippines the last few weeks, got to see her family for the first time in four years, and we finished our conversation a while ago, and, and she said, we're very blessed in America. We're very blessed. I'm thankful I don't live in the Philippines. I love them, but I'm glad I live in the United States of America. Amen? But in this nation, we are uh, this rugged individualism that built our country. has has, And I know that, that some of the political uh, aspirations of, of certain groups are trying to get us all to fit into a box, but I think that's going to be very difficult in America. 
I think because we were built on this rugged individualism. We were built on this this idea that a man in America, that a woman in America, whether they're red, yellow, black, or white, and female, male, it doesn't matter, that a person can excel, that a person can do uh, greater things than those that came before him. He can exceed what his forefathers. You can still do that in America. And we've got a man in our White House today that's, that's of mixed race and from from uh, 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 his some one of his parents is from another country, and he made it. And whether you agree with him or not, it, that doesn't matter. He is just an example that in America, you can do anything. You can you can aspire to greatness and achieve it. I'm thankful for that. A man that grew up with a single mom and never had anything in this world. I uh, grew up in Hot Springs, Arkansas, was born in Hope, Arkansas, uh, became the most popular president since Ronald Reagan and one of the most popular presidents in history, whether you agree with him politically or not. He, Bill Clinton is proof that you can be born in the backwoods of Arkansas with no possibility, and if you just persist long enough, you can succeed. Uh, and most of the great successes in America came from men and women who started with nothing. In other nations in the world, that's just not possible. But a lot of the reason that happens is because we all have in our heart, it's born in us, especially as Americans, it's expected for us to want to excel. And if we don't want to excel, then sometimes we're classified or looked at as a failure. We still have this mentality in America that he who dies with the most toys wins. So far, I'm ahead. I don't know that, I think sometimes that's a little bit disturbing because we grasp and fight, they, and they say that the work ethic in America is still so much stronger than other nations in the world. You know, is, is it a 32-hour work week in France? All of Europe's 32, what a bunch of wimps. I do that in two days sometimes. Yeah. But it does kind of make some of you want to move to Europe, I think. But, but we work and, and we grope and grasp and strive for things. And I'm going to say this to you. I'm thankful for America and I'm thankful for the blessings. I'm thankful for all the wonderful things God has blessed me with. But they will bring you no fulfillment unless you have your relationships in proper order. It doesn't matter what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live in, where you go on vacation. None of that matters if you're miserable in your relationships. And no fun flying to Bermuda by yourself. Because everybody that knows you can't stand you. That's pretty good preaching right there. You made a lot of money, but if you make it by stepping on the shoulders of other people or by harming other people, you're not successful, really. You may be successful monetarily, but you're not successful in life. And Jesus contrasted that whole concept. And he takes what we think is a debasing thing, and he elevates that to the highest level. The Bible said he chose the simple things to confound the wise. He confounded the wise by saying, if you want to be their leader, if you want to be their minister, if you want to be their ruler, you're going to have to first be their slave. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Let him be your slave. Let him be, if you're going to ascend to the highest, you're going to have to start at the lowest. Jesus already was the highest. He was God manifest in the flesh. And he got up on that last meal and he put a towel around him. He took off his robe and he put on a towel. And what was the significance of that? In a Hebrew household, the very lowest servant in the house, the slaves were not aware, allowed to wear robes. The very lowest form of servant was not allowed to wear normal clothes. The one that washed the nasty feet of the folks that walked into the house, the guest, he wore a towel. The one that cleaned out, they, they didn't have plumbing like we have. They have this little places in there with pots where a man would go in and use the restroom. And this man that wore the towel, he would clean those out. And that was his job. And Jesus said, if you're going to ascend to the highest, 
you're going to have to be the potty cleaner. You're going to have to wear the towel. Oh, my goodness. You're going to have to. Wow. That's pretty good preaching. Paul knew what Jesus meant in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 19. I'm almost finished. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant. In other words, I made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. If I am going to convince people to, to create in their heart a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to have to serve them. I'm going to have to be their slave. I'm going to have to be their minister. The word minister, it comes from the root word servant. You're not going to be a preacher or a minister until you're first a servant. You're not going to win people to the kingdom of God by showing them how smart you are or how much money you can make or by stomping on them and harming them. You're only going to be successful in life when you become a servant or a slave to somebody. Let me say this. I, I have to serve people I don't agree with. We have to serve people we don't agree with. We have to build relationships with people from a servanthood standpoint that we totally disagree with their ethics or their morals or the places they go or the things they do. Jesus became a servant to everyone he met, and he redefined. He, he became a servant to the sick the blind, the withered, the halt, the lame. He became a servant to them, and he redefined authority. And he began that redefining when he knelt and he washed the feet of his disciples. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 8. And being found in appearance as a man, it's talking about Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. We have, the Bible said in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and in the other most parts of the earth. What did he give us the power for? What were we empowered to do? How come he came? Uh, well, we, we think about things like uh, laying hands on the sick. We think about, we think, uh, uh, about things like uh, 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 preaching or speaking or ministering or uh, we think about things like they didn't when they drank a deadly thing it wouldn't hurt them they tread on serpents and they wouldn't get we think about Daniel in the lion's den and we think about things that 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 concern spiritual authority but he really gave us the power the Holy Ghost power allows us to humble ourselves and build relationships Boy, that this is so. This is so hard. I mean, I, if this was a, a red Corvette, it'd be easy to sell to you. But but the, the, the concepts that I'm trying to teach. It's it, it, he gave us power to humble ourselves and say I'm sorry. He gave us power to humble ourselves and wash the feet of maybe someone that we think is lower class than we are. He gave us the power, the ability to say, hey, I'm wrong and you're right because within our flesh, we don't have that ability. Within our flesh, we want our opinion is the only one that's right and our opinion is the only one that's matter. But God said, I'm going to give you power to be a servant. I'm going to give you power to be a slave, even to people you don't agree with. And when you serve those people, when you love those people, when you, you help those people, when you journey in their pain with those people, they're going to love you and they're going to want to know your God. And the whole reason that Jesus came and ascended into heaven and sent back his spirit on the day of Pentecost was so that we could create relationships that didn't make any sense in the world. I got a lot of things that I don't agree with. I do things that you don't agree with. But you know what? I want to say this, and I don't know exactly how to say it without just saying it. It's just been a few weeks ago now. I I, I had a a man that was 
in what I consider in my mind in the worst kind of sin. Trying to do better. But instead of me being a judge, I allowed him to ruin my dress shirt. He laid on my shoulder and he wept and he wept and he wept. I, normally, the old me would not would have judged and pointed and preached hellfire and brimstone. But when the Holy Ghost is at work in me, it's a whole different way of thinking. If we allow the Lord to work, I'm going to get on my knees one more time. I'm going to wash the feet one more time because who knows, if I can continue to serve, if I can continue to love, if I can continue to try to build a relationship, it might be that their life can change and their relationships can be healed. When the Lord talks about healing our wounds, I'm going to tell you, healing your physical wounds is good, but you're going to die something one of these days because it's appointed unto man once to die. But if somehow the Spirit of the Lord can heal our spiritual wounds through our relationships with one another, come on, you've got things that are broken, you've got relationships that are broken, and you think other people are wrong, and they may be wrong. They probably are wrong. It don't matter who's right. It don't matter who's wrong. Come on, somebody stand up and be a Christian. Somebody stand up and be a servant somebody stand up and be a leader because a slave and a leader are the same thing in the mind of Jesus somebody be a leader and say hey sister Marge I'm so sorry I'm so sorry I love you and I don't want to fuss I don't want you to be mad at me somebody stand up in your marriage and say hey I know we've both been wrong but I'm going to get on my knees and I want to fix it if I possibly can somebody go to your children and say hey daddy or mama was wrong daddy or mama just love you somebody have enough of God enough of a servant attitude that we can go fix our relationships with one another People blame the preacher for everything. I'm used to it. I mean, yeah, I got blamed for stuff I didn't even know about. I, I, I had a, I, I had a conversation last night, and uh, and I didn't even know. I had a con- I finished that conversation this morning, and, and you know, it's easy. You think it's easy for you to become better. You ought to try being the preacher. Well, you didn't do enough, brother Willie. You didn't. Well, I didn't know. And so you start defending yourself, and it's easy for you to build walls around yourself. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus never did it. He just stretched his arms and let them beat him. It doesn't matter how bitter, it doesn't matter how upset or how right you think you are, being right is way overrated. Did you hear me? I said, being right is overrated, and you you think you're so right, which probably means you're wrong. You're not the smartest person you know. I didn't get a single amen on that. It's me. No, I'm just kidding. But God, if God could convict us, of our lack of servanthood in our relationships. Am I preaching to anybody today but me? If God can convict me of my lack of relation, I could give you a list of expectations of what I want from you in your relationship with me, and it absolutely in the kingdom of God means nothing. Because if I will serve you, if I will become a slave to you, the things that I want out of this relationship will naturally come back. Unless you're just dealing with a complete idiot. And I know that there's some of those folks around that aren't going to respond. God will take them out of your life. And God will put people in your life that will respond to your servant mentality. You're only going to get a servant mentality because it's not American and it's not human. You're only going to get a servant mentality at the foot of the cross. You're only going to get a servant mentality in the upper room. You're only going to, the only way you're ever going to be a leader is you're going to have to go to the foot of the cross and you're going to have to take a trip to the upper room and then you'll get that mentality and that spirit. And I'm preaching to somebody that God wants to use. God really wants to use you. You've been blessed with abilities and talents, but you've got your ideas about relationships all messed up and God can't take the gifts that you've been given and he can't use those gifts until you get this thing fixed in your head.
Somebody say amen, please. If we're to be blessed, anybody want to be blessed? We've got to be less about me and more about others. Not a receiver, but a giver. If I'm going to imitate someone, I, I, I'm not going to wear a LeBron James jersey around. I don't know what number Jesus was on his soccer team in Jerusalem, but I'd like to have his jersey on my back. By the way, 4.6 people are watching the World Cup. I just can't get it. I sat and watched Germany play Ghana. Anybody watch that soccer game yesterday? Pure misery. Brother Jack. I tried. Uh, America, United States beat Ghana the other day, and, and while the game was going on, Brother Jack was trying to call me. I didn't answer because I thought Ghana was going to win. And then as soon as America won, I started trying to call him, and he won't answer. <laughs> That's funny. But I want to imitate the greatest leader that ever lived. I don't want to be a mental weakling. You can be an intellectual giant and a mental weakling. Do you get it? You can be an intellectual giant, but your mental stability can be very weak. You can have every degree in the world and be taking every kind of drug just in order for you to get up and function. I want to be... Strong mentally. That doesn't mean you have to be smart. You have to have an IQ, a high IQ. You can be mentally strong because Jesus died on Calvary and we're imitating. Follow me, Paul said, as I follow Christ. I'm not going to lose my individuality. I'm not going to lose my identity. I just have an opportunity to become great in the kingdom of God. I'm not going to lose any of that by following him. I'm not going to lose any of that by serving him. I'm not going to lose any of that by, by, by I want to, and we're going to talk about it in the next service a little bit. And I know it's children's church and there won't be a whole lot of folks in here, but I want to talk about what it really means to become great, what it really is to have a vision and fulfill a dream in your life and, 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 and how if, if we get our mindset right and we learn to love one another, and so if I want what's best for me, I got to I got to want it to be I got to want Tracy to be blessed first. Now I'm not much of an Amway guy, and you may be, but I do. Uh, they got this. I don't know if Zig got it from them or they got it from Zig, but. Zig Ziglar said, and I went to several of his seminars when I was younger. He passed away, and in my opinion, he was one of the greatest thinkers in modern times. And uh, I went to seminars. I actually went to one where he spoke at himself. And just to hear him speak, we just it just inspired me because he was so full of energy and life and smiles. And the first meeting I went to, there wasn't very many folks there, and there was supposed to have been a whole lot of folks there. You, you, couldn't, have tell, you couldn't have told by his attitude that there wasn't 10,000 or 20,000 people there. But he, he began to speak, and he said this, and I agree with it exactly. The only way that you're going to be successful, you're not going to be successful stepping on the bones of those that you've slain in your journey. You're going to be successful when you serve those people around you and you make them successful. And you become successful on their shoulders, not on their graves. And so if we spend our time, and we, that's, he was talking about money and business, but if we spend our time helping each other get through their valleys, helping each other get through their pain and their hurt and not judging them, then ultimately we become a success as well. Is that good preaching? God help us to be a giver because it's more blessed to give than to receive. But if you are a giver, you will, God will give to you, pressed down, shaken together running over, and men will give into your bosom, and you can become great in the kingdom of God. Philippians chapter 2, and I'm finished, verse 9 through 11. We'll read that, and let's stand together. Therefore God also has highly exalted him. This is the one that humbled himself, became obedient to the death of the cross, and given him the name. Everybody say the name. That's why I love this version. The, the King James says a name. I love the name. The name which is above every name. Anybody know what that name is? Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow 
of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How come everybody's going to bow? Is it because it's God manifest in the flesh? No, 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 no. The reason every knee's going to bow and the reason every tongue's going to confess is because he got up and he put a towel on. He took his robe off and he put a towel on. The reason everybody's going to worship, the reason he's going to be the greatest leader in the history of the universe is because he was a slave to the people that he loved. And he loved everybody. That's pretty good preaching today. Let's take it to heart. Let's work on our relationship. It don't matter what you believe about heaven, what you believe about hell, what you believe about the rapture or the trinity or any of that stuff. None of that makes a hill of beans worth of difference until you get your relationships fixed. doesn't matter whether you believe in same-sex marriage or you believe that it's a man and a woman or you believe that you believe that, that uh, you, you vote you're a yellow dog Democrat or if you're a dyed-in-the-wool Republican or whether you believe in abortion or you don't believe in abortion. And I think some of those things are very clear in this, but that don't matter. If you'll seek him first, if you'll get your relationships right, all these other things will fall in line. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So let's get these two. Let's love the Lord and let's love each other. And we show our love. I show my love. I want my wife. I want my kids to be. I want folks to say, well, that man takes care of his. He's a servant to his family. That's what I want. I I want that to be my reputation. I don't care about all this other stuff. I just want that to, I want the things that belong to me. I want folks to know that I've been a servant. I belong to Jesus. Jesus served me. I want to carry that into my other relationships in my life. We all should. Amen. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap of praise this morning. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. If you would, take a few moments, and it's Children's Church, and we've got a bunch upstairs. Take a few moments as we get ready for worship. Shake hands. We're going to start here shortly.